Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Canola Producers Commission, SAS Canola, and Manitoba Canola Growers. So we're here at Canola Lab in Saskatoon, and I'm with Gregory, and in front of you, you have a plethora of diseases in canola, so what are they? A cornucopia, almost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we have the three most common seedling blight uh, fungus is represented here in front of us, and they are Rhizoctonia, Pythium, and Fusarium. So what uh, conditions would each one of them be favorable? Uh, you know what, they're probably going to be fairly homogenous all the way across the prairies. Um, we have them separated here uh, because we managed to grow them out in a lab. But in the field you're going to see, you know, fairly, fairly common uh, well, for, like I said, homogenous blends of, of all three across the prairies. Uh, exception would be maybe in further north, uh, darker soils where you might, uh, darker, wetter, more clay soils where you might see colder, wetter conditions. It might favor the uh, Pythium a little bit more. Uh, likewise, in the piece, we tend to favor Rhizoctonia populations a little bit more. But again, across the prairies, it's going to be a, a combination of all three. So we more talk in terms of a seedling blight complex than any one, any one uh, particular fungus. Oh, so it's not really important to know the difference in distinguishing them apart? From a field diagnostic perspective, probably not really. They're all going to have fairly similar, um, fairly, you know, fairly similar symptoms. Uh, the Rhizoctonia will tend to wire stem, uh, we call it, uh, a little bit more frequently than the others uh, because it has a, a bit of an affinity for the, uh, you know, the, the hypocotyl hook, the, the arch that's of the canola plant that's between the cotyledons and the seed as it pushes through the soil. The arch actually emerges, emerges first and then the cotyledons follow. And that's the spot where Rhizoctonia has a particular affinity, which is why we tend to see associated, I should say, a little more with, uh, with wire stemming than, than the other two. So what does, what's wire stemming? Well, let's have a look. And here we have the Rhizoctonia plants. So here's what we'd refer to as wire stem. You've got uh, fairly wide stem up here above the soil surface and down here below the roots, but in between it's almost uh, completely withered and girdled away. Is that, is that water stem symptomology common across the board or which ones have it and which ones don't? Uh, you know, it's going to show up as part of uh, seedling blight. Um, so if you're finding wire stem, you can be sure that those plants that are completely withered off are going to die, uh, be it from one or the other. It doesn't. It actually doesn't even matter. Uh, but that's that's the symptom that we're looking for is is wire stem. Okay. What are some of the other symptoms that you look for? Uh, just completely uh, rotted and withered off roots and uh, seeds that don't emerge at all. So, for example, uh, we have here um, some not great examples of it. But in each one of these, there are eight seeds, um, and in this particular one, uh, only five have emerged. Uh, so when we go in digging, particularly, it's a lot easier with treated seed, uh, but you'll find the seed hull with the carcass of the shoot sticking out of, uh, roots and shoot sticking out of it that never did make the surface. Uh, so that would definitely be indicative of a seedling blight of some kind as well. So, we might, so we, might, we might see the symptoms like this even though we have treated our seed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, on average in Western Canada, we're only seeing about 50% emergence. Uh, so in a lot of cases, well, in all cases, those seeds will have been treated. All certified seed in Canada is sold with the treatment. Uh, and we're still seeing seedling diseases. Um, the only real control strategy that we have, obviously, besides the fungicide, is, is, is seeding depth. Um, and Ralph Lang likes to say that the, that the death by fungus is really like a secondary effect. Uh, yeah, it's, it's what killed the plant in the same way that hitting the power pole is what wrecked your car. Uh, however, the cause of both of those are probably not the same. Uh, losing control on ice and hitting a power pole, losing control is the cause. Likewise, in canola, excessive depth is probably going to be the biggest cause of uh, infection with, with any of these funguses. Yeah, so it has an initial stressor that makes it more susceptible to that disease? Absolutely. What, what, do, what do we do if we fa find the disease in our field? Uh, there's, really there's very little that you can do. Uh, you basically need to assess your stand and find out if you have enough to make a crop. And if you have enough to make a crop, then uh, what you can do for next year is uh, seed shallower or wait until your soils have warmed up somewhat because uh, they do tend to be more active in cold soils with slower growing plants. What, what kind of a stand are we talking about if we're discussing whether or not to reseed? That one gets really, really complicated. Um, 
we see yield potential really t uh, start to drop off when we've got less than five plants per square foot. Uh, but what really is going to weigh into that decision about whether you reseed is the calendar day. If you're sitting there on May 5th when you still have uh, you know, a very high likelihood of achieving top yields, um, your threshold is going to be is going to be somewhat higher. Uh, whereas if we're getting towards the end of May and you know it's three weeks after seeding and you're doing your assessment or even into June and you're down into that you know two plants per square foot or so range, it definitely would not pay to reseed. Um, and we have seen fields that were that uh, devastated by seedling blights that late in the calendar year. And, and in those cases, the best you can do is hope to go forward with the plants that are still there. If they end at see the seedling stage, and no, they don't. Um, these can continue infecting your crop all the way up, uh, all the way up through its life cycle. Uh, in fact, this complex, once we get up into uh, like later vegetative states and into reproductive stages, like around bolting, even, uh, we'll see them uh, express themselves as what we call brown girdling root rot, and that's the outside of the stem is actually girdled away, killing any nutrient transport up and down. But the center pith of the root is actually still intact, uh, so the plant withers and and uh, and dies from. You can actually see them in the seed row, and when you dig them up, uh, the damage is very much a girdled plant. Uh, take very careful concern not to confuse that with cutworm feeding, which can look like those purpled plants that are cut off at the ground. Uh, these will still be attached by the uh, by well the pith in the root, and uh, it's just all nutrient and, and vascular transport has been stopped by the by the disease. <laughs>